Uh, good evening. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Temple ISD Board of Trustees held here on December 12th, 2022, beginning at 6 p.m. Our first item is, is to declare a quorum, which we do have. Second item is the Pledge of Allegiance. Would everybody please stand and face the American flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Item three is the public forum. At this time, the board will now hear comments from those persons who have signed up to speak regarding items on the posted agenda. In accordance with board policy, each person may speak for no more than three minutes. During this part of the meeting, the board will listen, but will not engage in dialogue or debate with the speakers. As your name is called, please come forward and state your name and address. Uh, Mr. Charles Childs, and we'll be speaking on item 8F2C. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. And you'll have three minutes. All right, okay. thank you. And I'd like to thank the members of the board for your service. I know it's a, a hard job, and I know you make less than minimum wage, and uh, I know Dr. Ott probably makes a little more than minimum wage, but he earns it, and we appreciate him, and uh, he's gonna get some more appreciation here in a minute, I think. But I did wanna bring up one thing that concerned me a little bit, and, and it, all that I'm asking is that y'all give a little bit of discussion and explanation to it when you get to this last item on the agenda where you wanna change the board policy to uh, limit the public forum part to only agenda items. Uh, I'm a retired school person, uh, 20 years as administrator and 14 as a teacher. I've been to many, many, many board meetings and I understand completely why you would wanna do that and, and many re good reasons to wanna limit it to the board agenda. But I also have a concern uh, in squelching the people that pay for all of this, the taxpayers, whom you are too, uh, the First Amendment rights. And so when we get to that, when you get to that part, I would just like you to have some discussion about it, maybe a little explanation why you want to do that. Again, I, I can tell you 20 reasons why you would want to do it right now. And I know there are people uh, believe me, I know there are unfortunately people that want to go take the back route. They don't want to follow the chain of command. They don't want to go through procedures and all. They want to ambush you and all that kind of stuff. I understand that. But I still have a little bit of concern there about squelching uh, people's ability to be able to speak to the board, uh, particularly about sensible things. So that's it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next item is item four, superintendent's recognitions with Ms. Christine Parks. If the members will be, please come in front of the dais. Members, if you will come to the very front so that we can take our pictures real quickly, you will be that person in the
Our first item is the Superintendent Leadership Award, Isabella Rodriguez, Thornton Elementary School. Leadership is the attitude assumed by those with a vision to raise expectations, who are committed to achieving a goal, and whose conviction inspires others through enthusiasm and optimism to reach that goal. This award recognizes those who go above and beyond expectation, ex expectations to serve a cause greater than themselves. And this evening, we are pleased to recognize Thornton Elementary fifth grader, Isabella Rodriguez as the recipient of this award. We first came to know Isabella last spring when we saw her signing in the hallway. Since Thornton is the home for the Regional Day School for the Deaf, this in and of itself was not an unusual sight. But when we learned that Isabella was not hearing impaired and that she had learned sign language on her own in order to communicate with her hearing impaired mother and aunt, that is when we realized how truly inspiring she is. She has become a vital communicator as she interprets for her mother and aunt with the public. From volunteering with her mom in the church nursery so that she can interpret the children's needs to teaching her younger cousin how to sign so that she can communicate with her own hearing impaired mother. It is clear that Isabella is not your average fifth grader. Isabella, many of us uh, hear of a need and we're inspired to make a difference, but taking the initiative to take that step and do something about it is what sets you apart. Your acts of service above self is what defines true leadership. So on behalf of Temple ISD, we thank you and present you with the Superintendent's Leadership Award. All right, before I turn this over to Isabella, um, I will tell you this is the very first elementary student that has ever received this award, and I can't think of a better student. You heard all the accolades, everything she does. She leads in her church, she leads in the school, she leads in her home, and I'm certain she will lead in this community probably sooner than later for sure. Isabella, I asked you to say one thing, and that was to introduce your family. I thank you for the gift that I have from my mother that, and Did that. Do you want to sign? Uh, I think she's I using, I think mom yeah, using her translator. She has so oh. I, think she's um, I just thank you for this gift that I have right now, and I'm glad that I get to inspire it, and yeah. <laughs> you want to say anything else? No. They'd rather hear from you than me. Um, Why don't you introduce mom? My mom helps out church, and I help her out because sometimes she can't hear what the little kids say, and so I help her out when the babies are crying or stuff like that. You know, you know, kids, little kids. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and so mom, I'm just and help my mom here. when she needs it because I know she can't do it all on her own. That's why she has me. Uh, a helper that helps her out when she needs it. And yeah. That's that's it. All right. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, we are so proud of you. And you know, you always hear about concerns related to the future, but then when you see students like this, it just changes your mind and heartbeat, doesn't it? I mean, she's extraordinary. Let's get a few pictures. Mama, you want to come on up for the picture?
Our next item is the recognition of the Christmas card artist. And m most definitely one of my favorite times of the year um, is our Christmas card uh, finalist uh, and introducing them. Uh, I will get it back up on the screen in just a second so that you can see their designs. But for right now, let me first introduce our students. Uh, we have Daniel Aranga from a uh, third grade from Cater. Come on up. Clay Bouvier, Cater, fifth grade. And you always want to go right up there and oh, stand by Dr. Ross. You, no, you, you'll follow him and y'all all go. I know. Michelle e Ezijukal from Cater, fifth grade. Hamilet Grimaldo is not with us, but Thornton, fifth grade. Liliana Luna is Ray Allen, fifth grade. Gabriella Martinez, Thornton, fifth grade, is not with us. Emery Mendoza from Scott, third grade. Alani Robinson, Meredith, pre-K, is not with us. And Madeline Terry, KP, fourth grade, is with us. And while we get some pictures, I will pull up the designs on the screen for you. And to tell you a little bit about the Christmas card contest, every year we rotate. One year is elementary uh, contest, so students from pre-K through fifth grade across the district. And then the other year is students in sixth through twelfth grade. So this is our elementary year, and the students did a fantastic job as did their teachers. And so we appreciate our art teachers so very much. And so if you are here tonight as one of their teachers, if you would join us up here. <laughs> we expect nothing less from fine arts than creativity. And I promised parents that we would hold them as long as we needed to up there. Um, uh, teachers and kiddos, this, year, uh, this week you will get a copy of the poster that's displayed on the back on the monitors that has all of your designs. And you'll also get a personalized set of your own design pictures, Christmas cards for your parents to take home. So those will be delivered to you this week. Um, let's see. Where's my snowman? Happy, happy holidays. Right there, stand right there, stand right there. This was selected as the design for the district Christmas card this year. We had staff vote on it from across the district. So this serves as our design. You're not proud. So anyway, guys, thank you so much for sharing your talents with us and doing such an amazing job. The different mediums that you used were amazing. We had, I think, pencil drawings. We had watercolor. We had the stained glass, which were absolutely amazing. So thank you so much, and we're so proud of you. So thank you for helping the Christmas season be a little bit brighter for all of us across Temple ISD. We appreciate you. I just want to say just want to say this is actually one of my favorite times of the year. Always looking forward to these Christmas cards. I've been on the board 11 years and have received 11 sets of the Christmas cards. Uh, they're beautiful. We really do have talented kids, students in our district. Uh, amazing fine arts department. And uh, this is always just a joy to see this. So thank everybody, the teachers, the parents, and especially the students.
we're good. I think we're good. Thank you, guys. And thank you, parents, for being here tonight. Again, you are welcome to stay, but you are also welcome to leave. Our next item C is Representative Hugh Shine, District 55, Superintendent, Superintendent of the Year Recognition. Hugh, you're going to have a hard time following this up. Oh, I, there's no way. There, there's no way. So I, I was, you stole the words right away from me. I mean, following that act uh, with all of those kids. You know, this is the first opportunity that uh, Bobby's schedule and my schedule has worked out where we could do this in a formal presentation. Okay, and we didn't want to just do it. We wanted to make sure it was done in a special way because not every school district has the privilege and opportunity to have a leader like Bobby Ott. And we're very fortunate to have his leadership. So I have a few words I'd like to share and then make a presentation. Um, you know, when I think about Superintendent Dr. Bobby Ott's leadership at the helm of TISD, I think about how important leadership is to any and all organizations in our lives. It's leadership that makes a difference in whether an organization is successful. Ronald Reagan stated, he said, the greatest leader is not necessarily the one who does the greatest things. He's the one that gets the people to do the greatest things. Bobby's successful in doing that. So when I see Bobby's school involvement, and I get text messages and emails recognizing others in this district and promoting the activities in this district, it reminds me of a statement that Sam Walton made. He said, outstanding leaders go out of their way to boost the self-esteem of the people they work with, of their personnel. If people believe in themselves, it's amazing what they can accomplish. We're the evidence of that in this school district. Bobby's a trailblazer. He makes a path for others to follow. He inspires others to reach higher, to dream bigger, to achieve greater with his presence and with his encouragement. In fact, perhaps the most important leadership skill you can develop is the ability to provide inspiration to others, which Bobby does, and if you inspire them to reach for the stars, they just might bring you back the moon. President John Adams stated, he said, if your actions inspire others to dream more, to learn more, do more, and become more, you're a leader. So leadership's not about titles, it's not about positions or flow charts. It is about one life influencing the lives of others. Leadership is an action, not a position. You don't lead by pointing and telling people someplace to go, you lead by going to that place first, making a case, not following the path that may lead, but instead, where there is no path, you leave a trail. And General of the Army Douglas MacArthur said, a true leader has the confidence to stand alone, the courage to make tough decisions, and the compassion to listen to the needs of others. He does not set out to be a leader, but becomes one by the equality of his actions and the integrity of his intent. It's about pursuing excellence. The result of caring more than others think is wise 
and expecting more than others think is, is practical and translating a vision into reality. That's Bobby Ott. So, by the way, Isabella shared with me she had her coin in her pocket. Bobby, like I said, Bobby and I have not had an opportunity to have a presentation like this, but as a former military guy, my, command, my coin as a commander meant a lot to the troops. So I designed one as your representative so that I could do the same thing for people like us in this room, all of you and others, to commend you for something special that you've done, commend you for your leadership, to show appreciation on behalf of the people of the community of what you are doing, what you have accomplished, and what we know you will do in the future. So it has the seal of the state of Texas. It's a pretty good size coin. Has the state with some of our notable, you know, the mockingbird and the blue bonnet and the state. And a kind of a quote that's mine that I share, and this is appropriate for folks that I give this to. Next to faith and family, serve in your country, in this case your community, it's the highest calling. Bob Yacht. Thank you. without recognizing Debbie Shine, who is yes. the backbone of the office, who who's, I consider a second representative for us. So Absolutely. thank you for coming, Debbie. Thank you, Hugh. Thank you. Debbie. Appreciate both of you. Item D is the Texas Association of School Board Superintendent of the Year Award, Dr. Dan Troxell. Well, President and members of the Board of, uh, of Trustees, thank you for having me here tonight. I'm. Dan Troxell, the Executive Director of the Texas Association of School Boards. It is such an honor to recognize Dr. Ott as the 2022 Texas Superintendent of the Year. You know, throughout the history of the state of Texas, there's been less than 40 superintendents of the year. So Dr. Ott, you're in very rarefied company, but one that I know you're well deserving of. I've known you for a very long time. As a matter of fact, one of your relatives worked for me for a number of years, and so, We've gotten the opportunity and the honor of really forging a friendship. And what I've noticed over the course of those years is what our board of directors, we have a 42 member board, um, said about you during the interview process, the things that they pointed out that really led to you being recognized across this great state as the superintendent of the year. First, you connected the kids, and we saw the kids today connect to your board and the community. You connect the kids to the businesses throughout this community. That's a rare thing in a school district to see the businesses come together to support the community schools that they locally support. You ensure that so that every student has an opportunity beyond high school to matriculate into the world of work, into colleges and universities, into the military and other opportunities, and you're recognized for that. Secondly, they pointed out that you engage the entire community, grandparents, aunts and uncles, relatives, in the education of kids and that you look very much forward to the opportunity to recognize children like you've done tonight for the work they've done. But the thing that impressed them the most is what you heard from, from our state rep just a few minutes ago. That is, you always give credit to others. You know, they were just inspired by the way that you give credit to your staff, those of you in the audience that work with Dr. Ott, the board of trustees that's standing with you this evening, uh, but more importantly to the children that you serve. And you saw so many talented young people tonight. And as a former educator, there's nothing that makes my heart sore than seeing children shine and then being recognized for that. And you ensure that happens each and every day. So let me formally recognize you, congratulate you, Dr. Bobby Ott, Superintendent of the Year 2022.
but I think going through this process for me, you know, they don't ever really ask you questions about you specifically. They're asking questions about who you work with, what's going on, and who you serve. So when superintendents have asked me about the process, and they do, tell them just keep in mind that it's about that much to do with you and this much to do with where you serve and who you serve. This would not be complete without <laughs> Dr. Ott when he received the word at the state convention that he had won, the picture with him, Looking down, all board members have signed this in appreciation for you and what you've done. Well, thank you so yeah. much. Yes, this picture has gone viral. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my friend Doug Killian, he's a superintendent of Pflugerville, I remember he said, it's time to lift your head up. <laughs> <laughs> After they announced it. So thank you so much. I appreciate each of you board members for all your support and, of course, the leadership team and all the administrators and teachers there. But uh, this is really a group of really strong men. Next item is item five, the executive hires. Dr. Ward. Dr. Adams, you can approve that. Oh, okay, very good. Dr. Ward, a graciously let me present this to you. And the item A is consideration for approval to hire director of digital learning, yes. Dr. Adams. Uh, so good evening. Um, we are the um, we are very excited to present uh, for uh, for your consideration, Miss Ashley Jones, for the director of uh, digital learning. Uh, the interview committee consisting of Renata Rogers, Dr. Beth Jenowitz, Dr. Casey Bloomquist, Dr. Tiffany Weiss, Vance Willis, and Dr. Lisa Adams interviewed uh, for the position of director of digital learning on December 8, 2022, and selected Ashley Jones as our lone finalist for this position. Miss Jones graduated from Our Lady of the Lake University. University in San Antonio with a dual degree consisting of a Bachelor's of Arts in Psychology and a Bachelor of Science degree in Kinesiology in the spring of 2013. In the spring of 2016, she graduated with a Master of Education degree with a concentration in Curriculum and Instruction from the University of Mary Harlan Baylor. And she's currently a doctoral candidate. She's a busy lady. A doctoral candidate at UMHB, and her dissertation title is Bridging the Gap, the relationship of teacher efficacy factors impact on achievement gaps. Mrs. Jones began her career here in Temple ISD, and she's taught sixth and eighth grade English at Travis Science Academy and ninth grade English at Temple High School. She's also served as a girls athletic coach and campus technology liaison while she was a teacher at Travis Science Academy. Currently, Ms. Jones serves as one of our elementary digital learning coach coaches for Meredith Dunbar Elementary, um, I'm sorry, Meredith Dunbar Early Childhood Academy, Thornton Elementary, Hector P. Garcia, and Ray Allen Elementary. Uh, Ms. Jones is married to her husband, Eugene, of seven years, and together they have a six-year-old daughter, Avery. You could probably spot her in the audience. Um, and she's a first grader at Thornton Elementary. Um, Mrs. Jones is excited to inspire innovative and equitable learning opportunities for students and staff using technology, blended learning practices, and STEM education. And it's my great pleasure um, to recommend Ms. Jones to the Board of Trustees for approval for the position of the Director of Digital Learning. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Adams. Are there any questions? This does require a motion. Move for approval. Motion by Mr. Gaines. Second. Seconded by Ms. Gowan. All in favor signify by saying aye. Any aye. opposed the same sign? The ayes have it. The motion carries. Congratulations. Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, 
I wanted to talk first about um, value add. I recently got a lesson on value add and thinking about the service to our community in education, that is kind of our goal, is to add value to our community. And so I wanna start off with thanking the people that have added value to my life as an educator, <laughs> sorry, and um, hoping in this role I can be a value add to the Temple ISD community and Temple as a whole. First, I would like to thank um, the school board for entrusting me with this role to hopefully um, still impact and inspire students, staff, and Temple ISD families. I would also like to thank Dr. Ott. Um, your leadership and guidance is a value add in its own. You inspire us all, and I'm so thankful for this opportunity from you, because I've also had the opportunity to learn from you in class <laughs> at UMHB. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Adams for being a constant for growth here in Temple ISD, not just for our teachers and staff, but also for our students, always pushing us to strive for the most. <laughs> I would also like to introduce my family, Eugene and Avery. <laughs> <laughs> She's sleeping right now. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, you guys um, mean the most to me, and even though I'm the butt of all your jokes, they're both of them. Um, I would also like to share something about my family because my mom and dad are here. And so, an interesting fact about my family and talking about service, as we talked about earlier, between my mom, Karen, and my dad, Abe and my husband, Eugene, they have over 74 years of military service. And so I learned dedication and hard work from you both first. When I started in Temple ISD as a teacher, it was a struggle. I was a first time mom, my husband was deployed, and Temple kids are tough. But teachers, Temple teachers love on their kids. And I learned from the administrators, the campus coordinators, the directors, everybody that I was with of why being in Temple ISD is special. And so thank you to all my peers that are here. I really appreciate you. Um, I also want to thank the digital learning coaches, Hugh Burke, Michael Merrick, and John Woodward, and Hannah Ketteman, who's not here. You guys are a group of innovators, and I'm so excited and inspired by all of you to continue leading the digital learning department. And lastly, I hope that in this role, I can be a value add, as all of you had been for me. Thank you. <laughs> Next item is item six, board presence report. A, future items of discussion. Members, is there any items you wish to discuss at a future meeting? Also in front of you is the legislative agenda that we discussed at our uh, last meeting, our board retreat, and it's been drafted. We'll vote on it in the January board meeting but you got an electronic copy and there's a hard copy in front of you. So if you could please review it, if there's anything, any comments or suggestions, changes, please let myself and Dr. Rott know before the January board meeting. And now uh, item B, important dates, Dr. Rott. Okay. 
Well, this will be quick, short month. Uh, so we have the Christmas Creations uh, act event over at the CT at Temple High School, and that is December 13th, 530 to 7. Uh, you've probably seen a lot of flyers and digital communication around it. Uh, very exciting event. Our students at CT do a great job of making gifts and things for, um, for purchase. And then we're closed for the break, the 19th through the 30th. And January 2nd, we have Temple University. That's a very exciting uh, professional development learning opportunity that we have with our teachers and staff. <coughs> Uh, and appreciate the sponsors that we've had in the community to help us with this event. It's a way to welcome staff back. They've done a great job. And uh, that will be, I guess, most of the day at Temple High School, the whole day at Temple High School on January 2nd. And then uh, right after that, or not too far after that, we have another board meeting, January 9th, and then a student holiday, uh, the 16th. You do have a few outstanding dates left on fine arts. Uh, for the remainder of the month in terms of uh, performances and concerts. That's on the following page. Uh, our students have done, uh, well, you saw even in visual arts here, but just all the disciplines and fine arts, they've really done a great job this Christmas season putting on performances and concerts, all age groups, elementary, middle, and high. So if you hadn't had a chance to go out and catch one or two of them, you still have an opportunity, and I would encourage you to do it. Uh, they would make you proud for sure. And that's all I have, Dan. Thank you, Dr. Ott. Um, next item is item eight, consent items, items A through E5. What is the pleasure of the board to uh, consider these items? Motion by Ms. Gowan to consider all the items together. I second. Seconded by Mrs. Myers. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, same sign. The ayes have it. Thank you very much. <clears throat> item eight, action items, A, human resources. No items tonight. All right. Item B is academics, one, structured literacy program. Uh, Franz Montana and Dr. Beth Genowitz. Welcome. And Dr. Adams. I was going to start just by giving a little background information before these ladies come up and present. Um, so, uh, in uh, 20 in 2020 21, um, our school district embarked on training teachers for the House Bill Reading Academy uh, requirement for all K through three teachers. You may remember that um, that was a requirement that was pushed by the state um, to support our teachers in learning more about the science of teaching reading. Um, and so as we began to train our teachers on uh, the research uh, behind how, how our brains learn to read, um, we quickly learned that um, our uh, the the instructional practices that were being you know shared with our teachers didn't necessarily align uh, with the way we were delivering our reading instruction. Um, at that same time, uh, the state of Texas reached out to us, a uh, TEA did, and, and talked to us about piloting a structured literacy program that was based on the science of teaching reading. Um, and so it was it was a very nice way for us to dovetail that training that our teachers were getting because we jumped out there even in the year of COVID and remote learning, we had half our reading teachers getting trained on that. Um, and, and we quickly learned that we needed some resources and really needed to focus to support our teachers in implementing those best practices to really support our students in how our brain learns to read, okay? And so what um, Fran and uh, Dr. Jenowitz are gonna share with you, Mrs. Smintana, I apologize. <laughs> and Dr. Jenowitz are going to share with you, um, is kind of our journey into piloting this. We, we started with an initial, you know, just a, a, a small group, and, and, and now we have a, a district-wide implementation. And so they're going to share a little bit with that of you with our journey, um, and then I'll talk with you at the end about kind of our next steps as we go forward. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to these ladies. And feel free to ask questions as we go along, because um, I know this is new for you. Well, good evening. I'm Fran Smetana, I'm the Director of Academic Interventions, and um, I want to talk to you a little bit about structured literacy and the why. Okay, all right, perfect. Okay. So structured literacy is um, based on, as Dr. Adams said, the science of teaching reading, which is systematic explicit instruction, especially in decoding skills, phonological awareness, and sight recognition. 
Those three things combined are extremely important for all students to be able to learn to read. Um, also, the science of teaching reading tells us that we have to teach reading by including wrote, uh, verbal reasoning, um, literacy and background knowledge, vocabulary and language structure, and teaching students how to think about what they're reading because all of our kids deserve to learn how to read. Structured literacy is actually um, building upon small chunks, the tiniest chunks of a word, before we move to the parts of a word, before we move to the word or the meaning of the word. It starts from the bottom up. Those decoding skills are what help our students to move forward in their fluency. But it also maintains on-level instruction. Everything our students read is on grade level. Um, and we fill those gaps by looking at diagnostic information so that we see where our students actually exist and where we need to fill gaps. But we never teach them at that level only. We teach them on grade level and build the skills so that they can get to grade level uh, understanding. Because all of that is based then on learning through sounds, because that's how we learn language, not by the letters, but by the sounds. The two-strand approach is based on what Dr. Adams was talking to you about, which is the science of teaching reading. There's a body of research around how we learn to read. Um, and that body of research tells us that we have to take the sound symbol relationship, that decoding piece of learning to read, and combine it with language comprehension. And we'll be very clear that language comprehension is not reading comprehension. Language comprehension is vocabulary based, and it's about students being able to speak to a, a variety of topics. So we have to build that spoken language for our students, not just the decoding pieces. So let me tell you what this means for our kids. Our kids have not always been exposed to those decoding skills and strategies with comprehension. They were taught separately. And so the science of teaching reading tells us we have to combine those things. So those decoding skills are embedded into rich, on grade level literature for all of our students. And so they are being exposed to not only building those strategies for how to decode words, but they're also getting a rich background knowledge that those words and those structures are built into. That means that all of our kids, as they well deserve, are getting that rich exposure to all of that background knowledge that not necessarily every comes to, everybody comes to school with. So those um, vocabulary skills allow the students to read, to apply those skills inside of that literature, to build beyond fluency into comprehension. And that rigorous on grade level literature allows our students to read, think, talk about, and what our favorite word is, grapple with content. Mm -hmm they get to really engage in rich discussions about some rich, on-level, deep literature. And you guys, if they never get to talk about it, it doesn't matter if they can read the word. They have no synaptic connection to it, so they're never gonna understand it. We have to build all of those connections for our kids, and this structured literacy allows us to do that. Um, our timeline actually began before 2021. It began in 2019. In 2019, yeah, it's okay. I got to correct Dr. Adams. It's pretty cool. Um, next one. In 2019, we began a pilot program for uh, the reading grant. And that reading academy allowed all of our elementary campuses to attend the House Bill 3 Reading Academy. Um, the principals attended, the instructional leaders attended so that we could get a, a real good grasp of what the state was trying to tell us was important about teaching reading. And that laid the groundwork for the why. That why is a two-strand approach. The science of teaching reading is the body 
of research about how we learn to read and structured literacy is how we implement that body of research. In 2021, in the spring, um, Commissioner Morath approached our district and asked us to pilot at three campuses. Um, those three campuses were Ray Allen, Jefferson, and Western Hills. And at that time, I was the principal at Ray Allen. And so I have a very deep connection to this research because Dr. Adams very clearly said, you guys have to decide if you think this is really what you should do and what's best for kids. Um, and if you really feel like this is what's for best for educating all of our children here. And so we dug deep. We dug into the science of teaching reading. We made the connection between what we were learning in the House Bill um, Reading Academy and recognized that this dual um, approach to teaching children through structured literacy really was going to help our students to close gaps and get where they needed to be. So um, we dug in uh, and determined that uh, this uh, research was going to allow us to really impact all students from the diverse backgrounds that we know we have here in Temple. Uh, we were sold. Structured literacy is the way to implement this body of research. We also researched the state's requirements. Um, the state uh, required us to go through CRIMSI um, and, and also the vendor that the state had selected because we wanted to make sure that we had all of those components um, put together before we determined that, yes, this is what we were going to do. Um, and then we began to lay out the changes to our teachers and reminding them of the why behind structured literacy and the science of teaching reading. In the summer of 2021, um, we had to start working on the real organization of how we would implement this. Uh, we had to restructure our master schedules um, so that we could have enough time in our core instruction um, to make sure that we were implementing with fidelity. We had to research CRIMSI, which is COVID Recovery Instructional Materials Support Initiative, st the state's initiative to help us close those gaps, um, and what the reporting would be and the registration would be for all of our teachers and leaders, and also how to figure out how to implement without materials. Because as you know, we were all still facing shipping delays. And so we figured out a plan for how we were gonna get materials into our teachers' hands and our students' hands day two. We also looked at the scope and sequence because how we were implementing was not going to look the same as the other five campuses. We had to look at how our professional development was going to be because we were looking at a completely different um, type of instruction than the other campuses were. We also needed to talk about our CBA and whether we wanted to change it for our special campuses or whether we were just gonna let it lay and see how well our kids did. And we decided to let it lay and see how well our kids did. And then we also changed our roadmap so that we knew we could fit the entire year within the year. In August and September, we began that implementation journey. We started in our PLCs, we adapted by saying, we no longer are digging for materials. We're not planning anymore. Those high quality instructional materials were sitting in our teacher's hands. We just had to figure out how to best deliver them. We also looked at the unit assessments and the alignment and made sure that we were doing backward design with the uh, materials that we had. We began fidelity walks, Dr. Adams, myself, and Ashley Carroll across the campuses just to determine how well things were working and how we could best support. We also gave some feedback on what we saw as some common issues. And then we realized we wanted to see whether it was working for someone else, so we went to Aldine. Aldine ISD had piloted the previous year, and we got to, answer, we got to get some answers to our questions about can teachers really still have a personality here? And how, what does fidelity really look like? And how is this working for you guys? What are your results? In October, we began that mission building process here within our district. We had meeting, Dr. Adams and I had meetings each month with our district, uh, or excuse me, our campus teams to make sure that we could reflect, that they had an open space for their concerns, 
that we could talk about improvement strategies for our implementation. And we recognized pretty quickly that when we said with fidelity, the teachers thought they had to read that script with fidelity. And so we encouraged them to back up and use those brain-based strategies they know work to add some engagement strategies in because they have to be there and to let their personality show through but using the instructional materials that are already there for them. We recognize that the importance of lesson internalization is how we were going to be able to add those strategies in. The lesson maintains itself, but how am I gonna add those components back in that keep my kids engaged? And then guess what? CBA and our kids were successful. They were successful because they were learning about subjects that help them to make connections to literature. And then we reminded our teachers of the why. And the why bottom line is our kids deserve it. A very wise person once told me that um, telling our teachers that kids can't read high level quality instructional materials because they can't decode is like saying you can't have a milkshake because you don't know how to milk the cow. All of our kids deserve rich, rich literature. They deserve the milkshake. And if we can't get them thinking about it, then they'll never be able to read about it. Our mission expansion began in November and December. We began pineapple walks at Jefferson. Our grade level lead teachers would go see a lower grade level to see, oh my goodness, all of these things are going to really help us in our implementation journey next year. And then they went to see higher grade levels and they were able to see, oh my gosh, all I'm doing right now is going to be so important to what they're learning next year. And then campus leaders began those same pineapple walks to see what kind of vocabulary our first graders were using with each other, like independence and you're treating me like a peasant. We began reflecting at the principals meetings and our other campuses recognized that maybe this journey was one they wanted to be part of as well. We connected with the vendor, Amplify, because we wanted some more clarity on professional development and make sure that we were implementing at the highest level. By spring, all eight campuses had joined our decision to do what's best for kids. So now you know the why and you know the how, so I want to continue the rest of the story. Getting buy-in from eight campuses, that is no easy task but good news travels. And we didn't have to sell anything because we had been preparing for several years and going out and seeing it on the campuses, that's what made the difference. So that building momentum is super, super important. So what we did was we clustered each campus with a pilot campus. So every teacher got to talk to someone from their grade level, got to see their classroom and the good work that students were doing. They were able to ask questions before they had to embark on this journey. Uh, we, had, we learned from our panel of experts, from our principals, from teachers who were very honest. Um, and so we kind of learned from other people's mistakes. And that made our transition this year much smoother. Now we knew that we needed to get our new teachers on board. And so when new teachers were hired, we made sure to really do the why with them for structured literacy. So um, our journey isn't just about reading. It really, when we were preparing for TEA, we went to see Aldine, but you know who came to see us? TEA came to see us and they brought a group of about 15 people to come and see how we implemented Amplify. And as I was thinking about, well, what have we done to make it successful? It really reminded me of a puzzle. And the first puzzle piece really had to do with our leadership. It had to do with Dr. Ott and Dr. Adams. And it really had to do with everybody's belief in this room for equity for all and high expectations for all kids. And so, you have heard about cat chats and you've heard about some of the journey that we have been on with changing some mindsets about high expectations for all. The second piece really involved Fran 
and she was our manager. She was the one who, she was the logistics. And it takes someone who is a bulldog, and it takes someone who is tenacious, and someone to make sure that our scheduling is all done, that all of the pieces of paper and everything is signed, and she has done a beautiful job with that. I'm your third piece as the executive director of elementary because I am blessed with working with the coaches, the instructional coaches, the literacy coaches, the principals, and the assistant principals. So getting that group of people together to share and learn from each other, again, I didn't have to sell anything. They were just telling the stories of what was happening in their classroom. And the fourth piece is really someone that many districts do not have. And that is, her name is Ashley Carroll, and she is our Reading Academy facilitator. So long before we made the switch to structured literacy, she started the training, and she started developing our teachers. And so uh, she would go into classrooms, and she would see what was happening and the great things. And she was the constant to bring us to our implementation this year. She also has worked at the warehouse as big shipments of trucks have come in. Uh, some have been pallets just strewn about. I mean, it has been a, a logistical nightmare. So there actually were some things. Next. Yeah, there were some things we had to overcome and mindsets and barriers, uh, of breaking down barriers were one of the things. So uh, shifting our teachers to, that's too hard for them to read, to where fifth grade is reading Don Quixote. And I'm like, who is that? You know, but they are learning about Greek gods and they are learning about the human body in kindergarten. It's just amazing. Um, so it's not too hard because they, we're helping build their background knowledge. And so they are, they are more than able. Um, and I hear it from a parent's perspective because Mrs. Rogers has a daughter in elementary school. And so she comes home and tells stories. Um, I do want to say that as far as like adapting our PLCs, we have, those of you that have teacher friends, I mean, it has been a shift. No longer are we looking at finding the resources. The resources are there, but understanding them and internalizing them, that's a whole different story. And so there's lots of studying ahead of time so that we can get to that practice piece. The bilingual framework, it was really important as we shifted to second grade, second semester, uh, to English, having equitable materials and side-by-side -side materials was super important. Uh, some of the barriers, um, our stuff didn't come in on time. Now, instead of three, I mean, Ms. Matana told you that it happened last year, and that was three campuses. Now try eight campuses. There have been times that uh, we've received partial shipments and we're printing like crazy, so don't ask me what my, don't ask me, just know that we covered it and we printed and teachers had everything that they needed. And I did have to change my copy code. I will have to tell you that. So um, just putting systems in place that we didn't even know we needed was there. Okay, next. Okay, so I see in pictures and I see faces. And here are some of the faces of some of the celebrations at the end of each unit. They have uh, culminating activities. And so here is some student work. Things that we're hearing when we go visit, and I think that there might be a field trip in your future if it, I think we could arrange that. So uh, just seeing the level of what students can write is just totally amazing. As far as CBA, one of the kids that took CBA one said, this is so easy compared to our unit test. And I was like, now when have you heard that? Never. So uh, that was pretty exciting. So we're going to continue to uh, celebrate our kids' journey. And our goal is to get 
more on grade level readers because our data shows we're making progress, but we still have quite a bit to get there. So equitable instruction is how we're going to get there so that all students will hit on grade level. We're not going to get to see the video, uh, but it's embedded in your PowerPoint. Or we might. It's only four minutes. Take your time to show you that, but it is great if you want to hear, hear from students and staff about their experiences. So we just wanted to share that in case you wanted to. Um, for us, next steps are we'd love for you to see it in action. I was in a fifth grade classroom last week. The writing prompt was, did Don Quixote's intentions justify his actions. I read Don Quixote in college. Um, now it's an abridged version, but I saw bilingual students, both in Spanish and English, responding to that. And they, I have never seen students write so much and discuss and grapple so much about, you know, what, is, what did the author mean by this uh, text, um, you know, in, within that. Um, I've never seen a fifth grader read an abridged version of Don Quixote either. Um, so we'd love to take you to observe. Um, a, an elementary reading instructional classroom is full of reading and writing. There's very little um, online uh, component to that. I know that we are putting more um, Chromebooks in those classrooms, but that is certainly not what's happening um, during a reading block, uh, especially the students are reading and writing, and, and it's, it's pretty amazing what you can see. So I'd love to be able to take you um, for our board retreat um, in the spring so you could see that um, in action. But what questions do you have? How can we, um, what questions can we answer for you? Members, y'all have any questions? You kind of answered mine. I was just going to ask, is this, is this something they do on the computer? Is it small groups oh, no. or is it, <clears throat> is it individual or large groups? Huh? Yes, all three. So okay. what we um, so there's always direct instruction, um, and then there's always students doing things independently or in pairs or in a small group. So based on the student's ability, um, where how, or their comfort level, or where they're ready to be able to. A first grader in a first grade classroom, you might see students reading independently. You might see students reading when they get to their reader part. Um, you might see students reading in pairs, and then you might see the teacher reading with a small group of five or six students, students because they still need that teacher support. But um, what you don't see is all whole group because we want to ensure that students are moving forward based on their ability um, and so we really push the teachers during PLC and the internalization of the lesson which students are going to do this independently which students are going to do it in pairs which students are going to do it with you because they still need those supports you know because we still do have readers that are behind um, and there there would be um, and they need the extra support of the teacher um, so yes all three the only um, software component we utilize during our extra special time. So you know how we have a, a time within our master schedule where we have enrichment and remediation. Um, Amplify does have a complimentary software and Fran um, applied for that grant. It's a reading blended learning grant um, and we applied for that. And so that's a personalized pathway to support students phonetic awareness, those specific skills that I might need versus what Fran might need. Um, but that does not happen within the reading block. Um, there's a, the only time, the other time you see computers is when we're practicing typing because on the state assessment, students have to respond um, in um, in writing with a type. So we do. We are trying to embed that into into their opportunities. But it's all there's very little computers during reading block. I don't ever see it. So the software component primarily takes place in like an RPI. Yes, like yes, and that's when the majority of of uh, even during math block instruction, there's not a lot of. Um, I don't want kids on the computer in element. You know, like on, in an elementary school, that is not. But it's not my goal and it's not the principal's goals and it's certainly not these ladies' goals. So we do use the computers for station, rotation, um, and specifically and during RTI as well. Mm -hmm. What other questions? Any other questions? Well, I know that Dr. Ott and I, myself will get together and we'll schedule it for a board retreat in the spring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's We'd love you great. to see it. No, that's exciting. Yeah. We'd definitely like to come and, Thank you so much. and, and, and see it in action. What, you've, what you have seen in our implementation, it would not be possible without these two ladies. They have done a phenomenal yeah. job of implementing and leading our principals. Beth and Fran, thank you all so much great. for everything you've done. Yeah. <laughs> and you too, Lisa. Uh, yeah. All them. All, yeah. them. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Item B2, 2023 to 2024. 
Middle School Course Catalog Presentation, Mrs. Renata Rogers. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ott, Mr. Posey, members of the board, this weekend I sat in the kitchen at the island with my fifth grade daughter, and she explained to me her reasoning for why Don Quixote's actions were not reasonable and justifiable, and she cited all of her text evidence to me, and so um, I'm really proud of the work that's happening at the elementary campuses um, for my own child, but also because it just means that our fifth graders are all the more prepared by the time they get to middle school um, to be successful at the secondary level. <laughs> I read Don Quixote in Spanish when I was in college, so hopefully it's better, uh, the abridged version for fifth graders. <laughs> um, so I'm here to share with you the middle school catalog changes, which are um, very few. Um, as we get new people in and as we uh, just put new eyes onto the catalog, we find little minor things that need to be adjusted, and so maybe this would be better worded in this way. Maybe people are confused about the way that this is um, laid out and we need to make an adjustment, and so that's really all of the changes that we have, not uh, nearly as much as we had for the high school, and so I won't um, take time to go through those with you. Uh, you can see them there. I believe you have a copy, and so I'll take any questions that you have. Members, any questions? Mrs. Rogers? All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate right. it. Thank you very much. Item C, facility and operations. No items tonight. D in finance. No items. Okay. E, student service. No items either. All right. F. <laughs> F, board committee reports. F1, facilities committee update. Meeting held November 17th, 2022 at 4 p.m. Mr. Gaines. Thank you, Mr. Posey. I'll try to do this without my glasses. My structured literacy may be all one word. <laughs> if I don't hold the sheet, just right this is from my face. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Uh, you can use mine. <laughs> <laughs> the meeting was called to order at 4.03 p.m. Dr. Ott discussed the future potential for projects and, and detailed options for the selection of a firm for architectural design and services. Uh, Mr. Boyd, Mr. Wolf presented the details of the list of, uh, sorry, the details of the list of the bond fund. The committee began the process of prioritizing items that uh, could be reduced or eliminated if funds are ultimately needed to offset the unexpected costs or increase of other projects. Uh, it is important to note that uh, no items that were uh, promised in the bond development process will be uh, negatively impacted. In addition of any items that are eliminated at the, that this time will remain on the uh, long range facility plan and be addressed at the, in the future. Uh, meeting was adjourned at 5.20 p.m. And our next meeting is January, 20. January 26. Uh, 2023 at 4 p.m. All right. Thank you, Mr. Gaines. Thank you, Dr. That helped. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Item two is the policy committee update. Meeting held November 16th, 2022 at 4 p.m. Uh, Mrs. Davis. The meeting was called to order at 4.04 p.m. Public comment on the safe return to <coughs> school plan was opened. No one offered comment. Public comment was closed. The safe return to school plan was discussed. There have been no changes to the plan since the last board presentation. Recommended changes to board policy EHDC local was presented. This policy will be presented at tonight's meeting for consideration. The meeting was adjourned at 428 p.m. The next policy committee meeting is scheduled for January 25th, 2023 at 4 p.m. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Davis. Uh, item B is consideration for approval of board policy EHDC local alternative methods for earning credit. Uh, Mr. Hogenberg. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, these, this uh, EHDC local uh, deals with uh, credit by exam without prior instruction. The changes uh, that we'll be talking about deal with the uh, acceleration from kindergarten to grade one. 
in current policy, it says these decisions need to be made uh, by the end of the first six weeks. Uh, we are recommending that it says uh, no later than the end of first semester, giving us a little more time to uh, evaluate uh, the student. The uh, recommendations that are in your board packet are slightly different than the ones that was presented at the policy committee meeting. Based on uh, your discussion, we, uh, at that meeting, we have included three and four of that items there, um, and that's our recommendation. Okay, thank you. Members, is there any discussion? Any questions? Hoffenberg? This does require approval. Move for approval. I move to approve is that the changes oh, uh, to BED local and EH. Oh, that's, that, that's, that's the, the next one. That's the next yeah. one. Mr. Sorry. Gaines, uh, Mrs. Davis, you make the motion to approve uh, EHDC local. All right. I'll motion second that motion. And seconded by Mr. Gaines. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed to like sign? The ayes have it. Thank you. Sorry about that. Yeah. No, 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 no. Item 2C, consideration for approval of board policy BED local board meetings. Public uh, board meetings, public participation. Mr. Hoggenberg. Uh, the changes in this policy are highlighted in your board documents. Current policy states that at regular board meeting, public comment can be uh, any topic. And at special meetings, those comments are limited to those items posted on the agenda. Uh, the changes this uh, presented are requires all public comment, both at special meetings as well as at the regular meetings, uh, to be on items on the agenda. And this is uh, in your packet for consideration. Okay. I do know that, you know, when we discuss this at, at the policy committee meeting, uh, members of the public can still contact the board members with their any concern. You know, they can either email us or make an appointment. And our email is on our TISD website. It's a trustee email. And Marilyn, I know it goes to all members too, so we're informed. So that way, you know, we still do hear considerations on a wide variety of opinions. Just not, that not necessarily have to be just at one at one form. Okay, members, any further discussion? They also have the, opportunity to put it on the agenda too, right? If we if there's something they want to bring forward. I think that's always a possibility. Yeah, they, they yeah. can make a they can make a request. Yeah. 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 They can make a request. Sure. Mm -hmm. And okay. Mr. Posey, just a reminder too that this is in line with TASB's recommendation. Um, their recommendation is uh, to go to this format. So just a reminder as okay. well. All right. This item does require approval. Is there a motion? Move for approval. Uh, sorry. I think Mrs. Davis had this. Yeah. I move to approve the changes to BED local. Okay. And I think Ms. Suarez, you have this second. second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Ayes. Any uh, noes, same sign. The ayes have it. The motion passes. Thank you very much. Um, been no further items. We're in adjournment. Thank you.